So warm welcome again. And uh, yes, so what I wanted to say is no one really can beat you in knowledge about Brexit and challenges to British uh, politics and economics. And I'm truly delighted to be able to welcome you tonight here at the Hattie School. So Anand joins us from King's College London, where he's a professor of European politics and foreign affairs. And before King's, he worked in Oxford and Birmingham. You founded, co-founded a very well-known journal called West European Politics, I have to say this as an academic. And you're a fellow at uh, Chatham House, I understand. But most importantly tonight, um, really Anand knows Brexit in and out. Out. So in 2014, 10 years ago, a decade ago, uh, you started the think tank UK in a changing Europe, right? which you still direct. And since then, Anand has really become one of the most vocal, one of the most insightful, and one of the clearest, I think, experts and commentators on Brexit and UK politics and British and European, British and European public and the media and really at the intersection of research and practice. So for anyone interested in Brexit, I presume this is everyone sitting here tonight, UK in a changing Europe, which is still in full swing, really has it all, right? Cutting at research projects, senior fellows, videos, reports, publications, and a top-ranked podcast our students and colleagues also often like. Plus UK in a changing Europe really offers impartial, interdisciplinary and well-researched analysis on Brexit. Not always the norm in reporting on Brexit in the UK, dare I say. So tonight uh, Anand is talking about economic and political challenges in the UK in view of course Brexit and the upcoming elections, we'll hear quite a bit about public opinion, political parties, and issues of salience for the electorate. Anand, I'm really looking forward to the talk and to our follow-up discussion, and I would say the floor is yours. Thank you, Christine. I don't like this clapping beforehand. It sort of raises the bar. Uh, yeah. So there's lots of stuff I'm not going to talk about. So just to say now, if you're interested in Scotland or Northern Ireland or want to talk a bit more about the Labour Party or the economy and those sorts of things, I'm very, very happy to talk about those things in the questions. But I'm going to try and stick quite brutally to half an hour and talk mainly about the interrelationship between British politics and Brexit, which is quite an interesting one. So essentially, they're the things I'm going to talk about. We're talking, the dysfunctional politics and economics, I really wanted to do the whole lecture on that, but I told you in advance I was going to talk about politics, so I feel I ought to stick to what I said, but I'll mention it at the end, and if you want to chat about it in questions, that's fine. Now, I've, I've talked through this early bit before, I think, the last time I was here in Hertie, but it is worth just reminding ourselves that Brexit did something weird to British politics by introducing a social division that hadn't in the past structured political choice. They didn't create a social division. Those of you with long memories will remember that the country was divided by Enoch Powell talking about rivers of blood. That was the Brexit division. But what Brexit did was it crystallized the division. You can see it here in graphical form. The more socially conservative you are, the more likely you were to vote for Brexit. And socially conservative means you know, your views on disciplining children, trans rights, gender equality, uh, those sorts of issues. So it's not the typical left-right divide that had used to structure British politics. British politics, as the Oxford professor Peter Pulitzer put it, was about class. That's how you understood it. Brexit isn't about class. And one of the things I'll come on to, and one of the things that matters <coughs> in British politics now, is that the two camps leave and remain divided by their worldviews, okay, whether they were socially liberal or socially conservative, were cross-cutting coalitions in terms of class. They brought together people with different economic interests, and that's one of the reasons why the, current, the Conservative Party is in the utter mess that it's in now, is that even amongst itself, it can't agree on basic economics because it brings together people with very different interests. Now, it's worth saying that over time, this values dimension has become more important. I suggest you'd probably find this in most countries in the West, that actually values issues have become more dominant over time 
in political platforms, in political manifestos, which this is a reflection of, and so on. Uh, and so I think one thing worth saying is that whilst I'm going to argue that Brexit is less important than it was because of the economic crisis, this isn't to say that Brexit will go away. The Brexit division in British politics is, I think, here to stay and can be triggered by a whole number of things which I'll touch on later on. But the second side of British politics is that economics was also very present when it came to Brexit. And I've got, I think I might have shown you this last time I was here. There's a wonderful way of showing this. This is the map of leave and remain in England. And back in, I think it was 2018, 2019, they had the last election for the mayor of London. And Rory Stewart, who I imagine you might have heard of, uh, was a candidate for mayor of London. And he was interviewed halfway through the campaign. But Rory is a weirdo, okay? Let's be under no illusions. He was asked during the campaign on LBC, what's your favorite pub in London? And he said, Pret-a-Manger. <laughs> okay, there's Rory Stewart for you. Uh, anyway, that was weird. It got weirder because Rory then gets absolutely murdered on social media by Corbynites accusing him of a metropolitan liberal because he liked Pret. And I remember I said to the people, our researchers in our office, what the hell? And they did this work and they found that. That's where the Prets are in the UK. And you will notice, I don't think you could do this with Einstein Cafe, but anyway, you could try it. It's a doctoral program. But I think you know, there is a very high correlation between where Pretz are in the United Kingdom and where people voted remain. And if you dig below the surface of that, you think about it, that's because of what Pret is. It is a sort of up and coming, diverse cities, people with disposable income. You can put it in a more social scientific way that basically the lower the median income in an area, the more likely that area was to vote for Brexit. So there are two things going on. I'm not for a moment saying this is only about social values. But social values are introduced as a dividing line in our politics like never before. And they go from the Brexit referendum, where they shaped leave and remain, into our national politics, where they shape our politics. So you can see this from the 2019 election absolutely clearly, that the areas that voted leave switched in greater numbers to the Tories. That this division completely reshapes the electoral map of the United Kingdom. So we had to get used to saying weird things like Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party wins Kensington or the Conservative Party wins Wakefield, where I was from. Uh, and I never in a million years thought Wakefield could have a Labour MP, but Brexit meant that we got a, a Conservative MP. Brexit meant that Wakefield elected a Conservative MP. It redrew the map, it redrew the map quite fundamentally because what Boris Johnson did was he created a coalition of Leave voters. Okay, 78% of the people who voted Conservative in 2019 had backed Leave. Uh, and actually, if you look into the numbers, there were more Remainers in the country in 2019 than there were Leavers. But the fact is Boris Johnson brought all the Leavers together to vote Conservatives, whereas the Remain camp was fatally divided between SNP, Lib Dems, and the Labour Party. So this changed our politics. It changed our politics quite fundamentally, but... In putting together this coalition, Boris Johnson also sowed the seeds of its destruction. Now, let me explain this next one to you. The, what we did here was we did a series of surveys of MPs, party activists, party members, and voters, okay, in descending order. It's all labelled. And what we did was we asked for their views on economic policy and, on, and their views on social values. And the point of this, and I can share these slides if you want to look at them in more detail, or if you're sitting at the back and you're blind like me and you can't see them. Uh, the conservatives are relatively coherent on social values. So the gap between conservative MPs and all voters on social values, and the gap between conservative MPs and the rest of the party on social values is quite small. The gap between conservatives and the median voter, and indeed between the Conservatives and their own voters on economics, is much bigger. The point is, the Conservatives could easily talk in a relatively unified way about immigration, about Brexit, about whether footballers should take the knee before football matches as a show of anti-racism, which became a massive political issue in the UK a few years ago, because they're all values issues. What the Conservatives can't do very easily is talk about tax policy 
or talk about, you know, the size of the state. Because the Brexit realignment meant that the Conservative MPs range from your traditional southern Shire Tory, your John Redwood, to your new Conservative MP in a traditionally Labour area with the relatively high levels of welfare dependency, relatively high levels of unemployment, where actually your economic outlook is fundamentally different, like Lee Anderson, who's been in the news a lot recently, the former uh, deputy chair of the Conservative Party. Lee Anderson's economics have nothing in common with John Redwood's economics. Lee Anderson doesn't believe in a small state. He believes in greater investment. He believes in taxing the rich as and when necessary. He believes in a generous welfare state because so many of his constituents are on welfare unlike John Redwood. So the Conservatives can talk about immigration, they can't talk about economic policy, and you see the punchline coming for this lecture, don't you? The last thing you want, if you're Boris Johnson's Conservative Party, is to walk into the teeth of an economic crisis, because that is the one thing that is guaranteed to blow apart the differences in your party. Now, don't get me wrong, there's quite a lot of other things that are responsible for the demise of the Conservatives over the last few years, not least their own behaviour. But in sort of cephalogical terms, it strikes me as absolutely fundamental that when you're talking about economic competence, you've created a coalition that is uniquely unable to display unity. And unity is one of the most treasured facets of party politics in the United Kingdom. So the first thing that happens is that the salience of Brexit crashes, okay? One of the reasons why Rishi Sunak is determined to talk about small boats, even though he can't stop them and won't be able to stop them, is because it's a cultural issue that takes the focus away from economic policy. The, le the, the Conservative coalition wanted Brexit to be quite a big issue because it's the one thing they can talk about quite easily. And it's worth just reflecting on this. In 2019, in January 2019, when we were having the first meaningful vote, in the Ipsos polling that this comes from, over 70% of people said Brexit was the most important issue facing the country. That number is now 6%. Back in January 2019, that week of the meaningful vote, the viewing figures for BBC Parliament, so not BBC News, BBC Parliament, exceeded those for MTV for the first and only time in that channel's history. So Brexit was box office. If you wandered around the United, I mean, we spent a lot of time traveling around the United Kingdom, you would hear, you would literally hear people arguing about it on the train, in the pub, in restaurants, wherever you went. I mean, I used to have this at home that, like, if we were going out for dinner with my friends, my, my other half would say, for God's sake, do not bang on about bloody Brexit over dinner. I'd be like, fine, I don't want to talk about Brexit. I'm at home, and that's great. We would go and sit down with friends, and nine times out of ten, they would start the conversation by saying, so what's happening in Brexit? I mean, it was a sort of a, nas a national plague, okay? So Brexit has receded in the public imagination. And actually, one of the very, very few things that link leavers and remainers now in Britain is that both sides want us to talk about something else. So just as a footnote, I'm going to show you some polling in a coming up that might give you the idea that the UK is ready to vote to rejoin the European Union. And indeed... Those people who think Brexit was a bad idea now f totally outnumber those people who think it was a good idea. So public opinion has shifted. But if you try and suggest to public opinion it'd be a really good idea to have another referendum, they'd string you up. They really are not interested. They do not want to revisit the Brexit debate at the moment, and I suspect for the foreseeable future. Now, the other thing about the Conservatives and an economic crisis is that all the polling reveals that the greater the level of insecurity you feel, the more likely you are to vote for the Labour Party. This is polling from the British election study. And basically, as economic insecurity goes up, time after time, in general election after general election, the evidence suggests that people are more likely to plump for the Labour Party than they are for the Conservative Party. But it gets even worse for the Conservative Party because if you think back to the 2019 election, the slogan that won Boris Johnson the election was get Brexit done, all right? It was a brilliant slogan and it was a brilliant election campaign. There's no two ways about that. But if your signature policy is not seen as working, then you have a problem. And there you'll see that a majority of voters now think that being outside the European Union has impacted on the cost of living crisis, has made the cost of living crisis worse. Now, let me add something here, which I think is quite important, and I think Remain supporters in the UK miss. 
The UK economy is in a bit of a hole at the moment, and I'll try and talk about that very briefly towards the end. There are also, you know, from the state of public services to the cost of living and inflation, which is still a massive problem, to the fact that we've had 15 years of stagnant median wages in the country. The UK economy is not just suffering now, but has suffered for the last decade and a half, and there's a huge amount of unhappiness at the state of the economy. Now, what people have done, quite often, is put two and two together and come up with five. That is to say, we left the European Union, prices are really high, ah, there we go. Now, flip that over, and if you can imagine, and it's a stretch, I know, imagine a world in which the UK economy is doing quite well. I mean, it is really hard to imagine that world, but let's try, okay, close our eyes. Imagine a world in which, you know, we've got 1% growth, which seems to be the best we can aspire to these days. But if you get that, and if people start to feel relatively comfortable again, and if people start to think, actually, I can afford to go on holiday and afford to feed my kids, which is a genuine issue for the British people at the moment, it strikes me as fairly logical that they'll make the same mistake the other way around and say, actually, Brexit is now working. Because the, we've left the European Union, the economy is doing better. So I wouldn't guarantee that where people are now in terms of Brexit is where they will remain. I think this is very, very contingent on a particular economic context, but that economic context is having a real impact on the government because it's not just that Brexit isn't going well, it's people blame the government for the fact that Brexit isn't going well. And most importantly of all, leave voters who overwhelmingly think Brexit is going badly, don't think Brexit is going badly because Brexit was a bad idea. They think Brexit is going badly because the government hasn't done it right. Uh, one of the most disturbing aspects of British politics at the moment is that we are full throttle developing our own stab in the back theory of politics and it is flourishing in the heart of the Conservative Party. You might have heard Liz Truss uh, in the United States this week saying it was the deep state that undermined her. Uh, she bizarrely said we need to listen to the will of the British people. Well, when I think 80% of the British people wanted her gone by the time she ended up, she finished being Prime Minister. So there's an interesting sort of dishonesty about it. But, the, but people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, others on the Conservative benches now argue that the reason Brexit hasn't worked is because we've not done it full-throatedly enough. We should have immediately repealed all those EU laws and we would be now more prosperous than we would have been. There is no basis, in fact, of any of these claims, okay, just to be utterly clear about it. But it is a series of arguments that resonates with the party faithful. Uh, and it is one of the reasons why the Conservatives are going to find it hard to let go of Brexit, because this idea that actually it could have been so good, but we were let down. Uh, is going to prove, I think, quite durable. Now, what has Brexit meant for the economy? This is interesting. Uh, that is a study by a guy called John Springford who works for the Centre for European Reform. And I'll just explain this very, very quickly. What John did was he took a basket of economies that historically have... Uh, mirrored the United Kingdom. So up to 2016, that basket of economies performed pretty much similarly to the UK's economy and extrapolated forward to try and get a sense of what the impact of Brexit has been. And his estimate is 5% of GDP now. Uh, economists argue about this. And actually, one of the wonderful, one of the best things about Brexit as a social scientist is that the UK has been engaged. I mean, I wish the French were doing it rather than us, but hey, we're doing it. But we've been engaged on a series of rather fascinating natural experiments. <laughs> yeah, I mean, social scientists would kill for the opportunity to do that. I mean, they talk about large-end studies. What happens if you introduce trade barriers to an economy? We can watch it in real time. What happens if you fundamentally change your immigration policy? Again, you can watch it in real time. And what we're learning about trade barriers is the impacts aren't as straightforward as the economic models would have suggested. So I think, I mean, there's a political issue to this, which is, Remain campaigners were so determined to have a go at Brexit that they talked about a cliff edge. And so leave backers have found it very easy post-Brexit to say, the world hasn't ended. You were all talking rubbish. So I think exaggerated rhetoric plays a role in this. But I think also it's some really fascinating phenomena. UK services exports have held up incredibly well post-Brexit, despite the fact 
that it is in services where the trade and cooperation agreement does least. The trade and cooperation agreement does virtually nothing for services exporters. Every day in the UK, you'll hear people campaigning about people, musicians, traveling musicians and the like. So there are obviously impacts, yet somehow our exports of services have held up and explanations range from the fact that we're doing it more globally now to the fact that because of COVID, people more naturally export services virtually than they used to. I mean, I've got a number of colleagues who rather than filling in the Belgian tax form to go to Brussels to give a lecture, just do it on Zoom, break the law, get paid, no one knows, it's perfectly harmless, they say, uh, till they get caught. But, you know, the other thing that's curious is this, goods imports have suffered to date worse than goods exports. And that makes no sense because the EU from day one impose the full gamut of border controls on our goods exports, we are only now starting to introduce the checks on goods imports. And yet, those imports have been hit worse than exports. So there's a lot going on. It is complicated, it is messy. What we can say with a degree of confidence is there has been a significant Brexit impact. That Brexit impact has been felt most strongly for the moment by smaller firms, because there is evidence of a lot of small firms pulling out of the uh, import and export market with the European Union because the costs are simply too great. And we can expect that impact to spread to larger firms depending on investment cycles. So if you're a European car manufacturer and you've invested millions in a plant in the United Kingdom, you're not going to shut it the day after Brexit. But you might think twice about doing a reinvestment in five years' time when you move on to the new model and you have a choice of building it in Germany or the Netherlands or Slovakia without trade barriers to 26 other economies or building it in the UK with all the paperwork that that implies. So this is an ongoing impact on the UK economy, albeit, and this is politically crucial, it's an impact that's very hard to identify amidst all the other things that are going on. So it is very hard to persuade Brexiters about the economic impact of Brexit, because you can point to Ukraine, you can point to all sorts of things. And this is a debate that will roll on. And now you're starting to hear people who are on the Remain side of the argument saying, I went to France last week and they all look a lot richer than us. And this will be the sort of debate that we hear playing out for ages. And the question is, at what point does that impact upon people's real perceptions and do they put two and two together? Uh, for what it's worth, and we can talk about it in questions, I see absolutely no prospect in the medium term of us having a serious conversation about membership of the single market, let alone membership of the European Union. But again, we can talk about that in questions. Now, going back to the politics, it's been a rocky ride for the Conservatives. They built this coalition. It's a cross-caste class coalition. Their major policy is seen as a failure, and the public are obsessive about the economy, which is the one issue on which the Conservatives can't really talk. So what we have, this is from the local elections uh, last year, is there is a Brexit impact still. So there is a still a kind of relationship between where the Conservatives are doing well and where Brexit did well in 2016, but it is a far, far weaker relationship than was true in 2019. So there's a sense of, there's a slight unraveling, if you like, of the Brexit impact on electoral politics in the United Kingdom. Again, this isn't to say for a moment that Brexit is gone, we don't know what happens when we're out of the cost of living crisis and we're talking about other things again. But for the moment, at least, if you want a, a number, we're probably back to 2017. In 2017, there was a kind of Brexit impact on our politics. So it was very different to 2015, but it was nowhere near the scale of 2019. And I would say at the moment, the tendency is to be hovering somewhere around there. Leave Remain still shapes the votes of some people. Uh, those Yorkshire Labour heartlands will never go back to being the absolute safe Labour seats they once were because politics has been changed fundamentally. And there's very strong evidence that working class voters simply aren't going back to Labour in the numbers that would require. But it's not 2019 over, all over again. You can't win this election simply by talking about Brexit. In fact, the Conservatives are very careful not to talk about Brexit because everyone thinks they've screwed it up. So that is something that they can no longer do. This is just an illustration, I'll circulate this because it's far, far too small, of what happened in Tamworth through the various electoral events we've had. It is worth stressing, and I think, again, this is true across the Western world, we are living in a uniquely volatile period in our politics. So to take the British example, between 2010 and 2017, 49% of the voting public changed the party they voted for. And those numbers are utterly unheard of. Uh, and what we're finding is 
absolute decrease in party loyalty, the notion that I'll vote the same way my parents or my community or whatever, those days are gone. The other interesting trend to watch in UK politics actually is far less localism than in the past, partly because of the death of local media. Uh, constituencies act a lot more like each other than they used to. So local quirks that used to shape electoral outcomes are nowhere near as important as they were 20 or 30 years ago. Then there's the dog that didn't bark. They are the proportions by which reform has underperformed its polling in all recent elections. So you have this party there that might be a threat to the Conservative Party, and unlike 2019, can only be a threat to the Conservative Party because there are no Labour voters who will switch to reform because that sorting happened in 2019. But one of the big questions in British politics is if, if reform can narrow that gap between its polling and its electoral performance, the Conservatives are in for an utter battering at the next general election because even in seats they would have been clinging on to, reform can take that 5 or 10% that they'd need to win. So one of the big things, that well, another of the reasons why the Tories insist on sort of coming out with a right-wing agenda is they see the greatest threat to their electoral viability from the right rather than from the left. I suspect they're wrong. I suspect they'll end up losing a lot of seats to the Lib Dems because they've tacked so far to the right. But they are, if I can put this politely, in an unenviable position where they're challenged from both left and right, and it's not obvious which way the party should go. And then there's the question of leadership. It is absolutely staggering that Starmer leads Sunak on everything. Sunak, remember, was brought in on the assumption that his personal brand, which was a lot more positively viewed by the public than the party brand, would drag the party up. Nope, the party has dragged him down. His ratings now are the lowest they've ever been. And this is a crucial one. If you look at Jeremy Corbyn, the 59% who did not think Jeremy Corbyn was ready to be prime minister this is the counter-argument to those people who say Keir Starmer is boring. Not that I'm going to argue that Keir Starmer isn't boring, but I'm going to argue that it doesn't matter because he's seen as safe. Okay? And being seen as safe is essentially all that matters in this election because you just need to be seen as a safer pair of hands than the other guy. And just to understand that, it's worth just spending a second on the myth of Boris Johnson. If you look at those lines, okay, the dotted blue line is Theresa May during the election campaign of 2017 and her popularity. The solid blue line is Boris Johnson's popularity during the 2019 election. The dotted red line is Jeremy Corbyn in 2017. The solid red line is Jeremy Corbyn in 2019. Boris Johnson, at every single point of the 2019 election campaign, was significantly less popular than Theresa May had been at the equivalent point of the 2017 election. So the 2019 election wasn't about a surge of popularity for Boris Johnson. It was about the absolute tanking in the, population, in the popularity of Jeremy Corbyn. Okay? And that's why Starmer not being feared is so fundamentally important. If you're not feared, people will consider voting for you. If you're not feared and people think the government in power has absolutely screwed the country up, then you should win the election. So Starmer, in that way, is in a strong position. There's one more thing I want to talk about very, very quickly, which is, and this will make no sense, but I can circulate it to you. <laughs> that is a diagram showing all the various attempts there have been to deal with regional inequality in the United Kingdom. Okay? I chose this for a German audience because, of course, in Germany post-unification, you put into place a policy framework and followed it over a period of decades in a bipartisan way, okay? That, for a Brit, makes you very weird because we are simply incapable of doing long-term policy making in the United Kingdom at the moment. And at the moment, the sad, the sad truth about British politics at the moment, I think, is it's not just the poisonous nature of inter-party competition. It is the fact of the failures of public policy. And one of the reasons increasingly why we have in place in the United Kingdom dysfunctional public policies is you cannot do anything at all for the long term in an adversarial system of politics. So take one of the big things, the health service. 
Health service is a massive electoral issue in the United Kingdom. And there's a paradox in the United Kingdom health service at the moment because under this parliament, the government has ploughed money. There's been a massive increase in medical staff in our hospital since 2019. And productivity has plummeted. Okay? Why has productivity plummeted? There are two main arguments. One is we are still living the after effects of David Cameron's austerity. And austerity meant we'll continue to pay NHS staff, but we won't invest in kit. So per capita, we have far fewer scanners, beds, any of the high-tech equipment that other European countries have more of than we have. So we have a lack of capital expenditure. But secondly, one of the reasons productivity in our health services has, has gone so low is because we have no functioning social care system and there are over 100,000 hospital beds occupied by people who should not be in hospital, but we have nowhere to send them. And the problem is our politics won't let us fix social care. In 2010, Labour came out with a scheme for, kill, for dealing with social care. The Tories labelled it a death tax and they dropped it. In 2017, Theresa May came out with a very, very similar scheme for fixing social care, and Labour called it a dementia tax, and overnight the Tories dropped it. There is a premium in British politics for disagreeing with what the other side says. And the problem for Britain is that if you think of any of the great issues of our time, the challenge of technology, the challenge of social care, the challenge of an aging population, the, the challenge of a climate crisis, they are all things that require long-term policies to be addressed. And we have a political system at the moment, partly because of the polarization that we've seen, and that has got worse since the referendum of 2016, that is simply incapable of delivering those long-term policy solutions. So I think that intersection, and this is what I really wanted to do my lecture about, so next time, that intersection between politics and economic policy is absolutely fundamental. And in the United Kingdom at the moment, we are almost a case study of how to do it badly. So the Starmer government matters, okay, because it's been so long since we've had a government that respected basic standards. It's been so long since we've had a government that displayed basic competence. It's been a long time since we've had a government that has a sufficient period of time to put in place a rational program of politics that can make a difference. The danger is that if this government ends up being a one-term government, it won't deliver because it won't have had long enough. And faith in politics, which is already at a historical low level in the United Kingdom, will fall even further. And that opens the way to the radicalization or the populistization of the Conservative Party that we're seeing going on at the moment. So it's a fairly salutary end to this lecture, I'm afraid, but I hope at least there have been some interesting things that you want to ask questions about. I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, Anand. I think there was a lot in there for all of us uh, to think about. I would propose that I start us off with perhaps two questions mm -hmm. about the Conservatives. Yep. And one is about turnout, and one is about the dilemma you already mentioned. So if you look at the Tamworth by-election right, mm -hmm. and the turnout there, the turnout during the referendum was almost twice as high as during the by-election, and I wonder what that means for the Tory party, whether you know whether it was the Tories who stayed home, but perhaps not wanting uh, to vote. So would that make a difference for the Tory strategy going forward into the general election? So that would be Tamworth by-election. But more generally, you already mentioned, right, so the Tories captured the red wall, right? They also have to appeal to voters in the South West, in Scotland, right? So, Red Wall, Brexit voting, South West, uh, Scotland, often remain voting. What does that mean for the Tory strategy? Do you think they will just not talk about Brexit? And what does it mean more generally in terms of the Tories going into the election later this year? Well, I'll answer the second one first. It seems to me that the Tories have decided that the main threat they have to face is the Reform Party, 
And the secret terror of every Conservative MP is that Nigel Farage comes out and campaigns full-throatedly for reform. And whatever you think of Nigel Farage, he's an incredibly effective communicator and campaigner and will increase their vote share. Can I just interrupt? I presume everyone in the room knows that reform is the successor of UKIP. Yeah, it's a successor of, well, it's a successor of the Brexit party, which was the successor of UKIP. And it's a very weird, I mean, it's a really interesting party because it's not formally a political party. It's formally a limited company. So it has no members and it has three shareholders and the whole thing is very, very strange. But it is polling at 10 to 15%, which is a real headache for the Conservatives. Because unlike a decade ago, so a decade ago, we had European elections that UKIP won. Okay. And that was the thing that really kicked off the, the Tory civil war on Europe. Uh, actually, one of the great paradoxes of populism in the United Kingdom is populism was allowed to flourish because of our membership of the European Union, because European elections gave UKIP money and profile. And actually, if you talk in private to people from reform, they will say, now, oh, I wish we were in the European Union. It'd be so much easier. Would you think, but hang on, you were the Brexit party. You can't say that. Uh, so, but back in 2014, UKIP were taking votes from Labour and the Conservatives. Uh, now they're just taking votes from the Conservatives. So I think they've, the Conservatives, for the moment at least, have decided that the major threat is from the right and that is where they will focus. Uh, the other thing, of course, is it's always been the case that the right of the Conservative Party in Parliament has been a lot more willing to threaten annihilation than the centrists. Uh, the so-called One Nation group of Conservative MPs is the liberal wing of the Conservative Party, but they are, as you'd expect from traditional liberal Conservatives, very well behaved, very polite, very nice, and very unwilling to make a fuss. Now, that's not a great way to wield political influence. So they've, they've punched below their weight. On turnout, I mean, by-election turnout is always low. Uh, it is very hard to know who hasn't uh, voted. What we do know is amongst undecided vote undecided voters are disproportionately 2019 conservative voters so the people who haven't yet made up their minds how to vote voted for boris johnson in 2019 uh, so the government still faces a dilemma about how to enthuse these people it's very hard to enthuse people when you've been in power for 14 years and most people think you failed uh, you know, which is one of the reasons why they're so desperate to find reasons to scare people about Keir Starmer. So I imagine our election campaign, which is going to be even more gruesome than usual, will be full of a lot of personal stuff about Keir Starmer, because the one way the Tories think they can get those voters out is by scaring them, which is what happened in 2019. A lot of people were scared to vote for uh, Jeremy Corbyn. But I think, you know, you, you, there is a limit to how far you can generalise from a by-election. If you want to watch a really sordid by-election, we've got the worst one ever coming up on Thursday in Rochdale, which is just going to be an embarrassment. But uh, I don't think there's much sucker for the Conservatives. I mean, we don't know what turnout will be, obviously. And, you know, there are two schools of thought. One is, this is a 1997 without the enthusiasm, but it is a kick the Tories out thing. And there's a lot of evidence from local elections last year that tactical voting is about as high as it's ever been in the UK. So in the seats where the Lib Dems were second to the Conservatives, the Lib Dem vote shot up. The seats where the Greens were second, the Green vote shot up. So there is, a, there is strong evidence of a very, very strong anti-Tory sentiment among the electorate at the moment. Excellent. Thank you, Anand. I imagine there are lots of questions in the room. So I would suggest we take three and then... Move on. So I would start with Mark, with Jesse, and with a gentleman with the glasses in the middle of the room. Test, uh, test. Mark Dawson. I think a, a microphone is coming your way. <laughs> Which one of us gets that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna. This was great. So, Christina asked about the Conservatives. I'd like to ask about Labour um, and how Labour are going to govern, in your opinion, and how they're going to tackle some of these challenges. Because, in a way, your talk was quite depressing on that score. Because, I mean, you talked about the challenge of Brexit. From, from my point of view, Labour has nothing to say on the subject, and it's related to what you said, which is basically they want to avoid it. But also the larger problem you pointed to, which is the dysfunctional political system, the dysfunctional, as a lawyer, I'd say the dysfunctional kind of constitutional order, 
again, Labour seem completely uninterested in, as far as I can see, in sort of changing the political system and making constitutional reforms and, you know, even, even in things like sort of integrity issues, there's a kind of reluctance to, to go big on these issues. So what does that mean? Where might Labour be going in a new term in office? Where does Starmer want to make his mark? And maybe you could just say a few words on, on that. Before Anand replies, uh, Jesse, are you asking about the Lib Dems then? Actually, I wasn't going to ask about the Lib Dems. I was going to ask about generations and what you think is happening with different age groups. Um, so many topics to cover, but I think that's been an important element, and we know that one of the factors in Brexit was essentially which year people were born in. I also wanted to add, tag on to the end of that an observation from Richard Corbett, who we all know well, but was a leading Labour member of the European Parliament. And Richard's had a line for a while that he thinks Brexit was a little bit like prohibition in the States in the 1920s. There was a moment when it was the issue. It was going to solve everything, break everything. Families split over it. You were wet or you were dry. It was attached to every domestic issue. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years later, it sort of wasn't. You know, it had become irrelevant. Everybody knew it had failed and it just sort of fizzled. Now, it's different from Brexit because it could be domestically cancelled very quietly, whereas rejoining the EU, a whole set of other challenges. That leads me to the question, what do you think is the next cultural cleavage issue? Because I agree with you that culture is beating economy in terms of how British mm -hmm. politics divides these days. What's the next thing that we all latch on to and fight each other about? Thank you, Jesse. And then we have the gentleman in the middle um, who is currently turning his head. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question would also be on labor and um, especially to what extent the loss of the 28 billion uh, for green investments, uh, to what extent that would kind of affect labor's chances. I mean, obviously, the outgo, outgo of the election is kind of not determined, but it's, you know, there's a certain direction we're all heading to. Mm -hmm. And um, how strong is that issue with voters? Uh, is it important to them? And also, what would you say would be Labour's number one policy priority once they do get into office? Simply from a technical point of view, what, are, what do they want to do policy-wise? Uh, less on a general, you know, right now it's when the election, what is the first thing that uh, Kistama will tell his chief of staff? Uh, when he gets into number 10. And then two questions on Labour. <laughs> First about how they will govern, last about green politics, and then one question about generations and prohibition. Okay, on Labour, this is where I lose my chance of a peerage. Uh, <laughs> what Labour do when they get into power is panic. Okay. You think back to 1997, Blair got in with a majority of over 100 and was like a rabbit in the headlights for four years because they didn't dare do anything in case they lost next time. And I fear that it's going to be a little bit like this this time because there's precious little in the way of policy pledges. I mean, there's some stuff. Uh, so, you know, they're thinking of having a statutory ethics commissioner in, in terms of your answer for standards in politics. They're, it's limited, but there are things they've said they'll do, but they've reined in on some of their grander ambitions. The 28 billion, which was actually 20 billion because the Tories are already spending eight. Let me say a couple of things about that because it's quite indicative of where we are. Even if Labour were to spend that 20 plus eight annually for the next parliament, investment would be falling in the UK because our investment performance has been so utterly rubbish. So even if they did this, we'd be on a downward trajectory. Okay, so the argument that we can't afford this strikes me as a, as a weird one. It is pretty cowardly, and it struck me that when they introduced the policy, they'd done something that was really important, which was that they generated a pro-growth narrative for pro-net zero policies. So we weren't in the world of, you know, the good old European People's Party, where it becomes a sordid trade-off between how much money you have and whether we worry about the climate crisis. It became a positive sum game. And they did that rather well, I thought. Uh, so I found the dropping of the pledge really depressing. Uh, they've still got a promise for completely green fuel and a deadline of 2030. How they reach that is anyone's guess. But it is very hard to see what they'll do in substantive policy terms when they come in at the moment, apart from being very, very cautious. How much do you think will voters care about them dropping the 28 billion, the number itself? 
I mean, that in a sense ties into the generational thing. Uh, I think they were probably silly to put a number on it because it gave the Conservatives a weapon. Uh, so I think it will matter insofar as the Conservatives can weaponize it rather than Labour voters bemoan its passing, if you see what I mean. Because Labour, I mean, it does seem to me really tragic that this year of all years, Labour are still playing defense on the economy. That is to say, we have to be ultra cautious or the Tories will weaponize it. Because if ever there was a government that would struggle to weaponize the issue of economic competence, it's the one that had Liz Truss amongst its numbers. Uh, so anyway, I mean, that's slightly depressing. In terms of what Labour would do, I don't think they'll do much on the EU. Uh, they'll tinker, maybe an SPS agreement, maybe a relatively meaningless security treaty with the European Union. The problem is the only thing in terms of EU policy that would generate growth is something that politically we cannot talk about in the United Kingdom at the moment, which is the single market. And I think, this, I think the Labour government will be a government dominated by Rachel Reeves and the Treasury. And I think the Treasury will very soon get bored of stuff that isn't doing anything for us economically. An SPS agreement will be great in all sorts of ways, not least with the Northern Ireland border, but it won't generate meaningful aggregate growth for the country as a whole. Uh, and I think it's absolutely the case. I mean, we have this Brown Commission. So Gordon Brown wrote this typically Gordon Brown, very long, wordy, worthy report about constitutional reform. Uh, my hunch is... Labour are going to ignore it and desperately try and persuade Gordon that they're not, so that he doesn't become problematic. I just cannot see in a first term a Labour Party that's been out of power 14 years suddenly decides to give power away to the regions or to undertake significant constitutional reform because there'll be too many other pressing priorities, to be honest. So I don't see much happening there, but I think Starmer will make a lot of the fact that he at least follows the rules that do exist as a way of differentiating himself from the Conservatives. On the, the generations thing, it's really interesting. I mean, it's really interesting because, you know, if you watch, you know, I was amazed to find out that Wilders would have won by more if the whole Dutch electorate was under 30, uh, which is unthinkable in a UK context because actually young people do not vote for the populist right. Uh, young people do sometimes vote green, and I don't think that's a particular issue for the Labour Party now, but it might be in future elections, because one of the things Jeremy Corbyn did was he killed the Green Party by attracting all those young voters. The one massive issue that is a, an issue across Western democracies, and even in polling in the United States is a massive issue, is the, is the electoral cleavage between those with a university degree and those without. Uh, that's something I don't think we spend enough time thinking about or worrying about because it is very, very obvious in terms of uh, the UK. Bear in mind in terms of young people as well, we don't have many of them and their turnout is low. I mean, we're, we're an old country, okay? So actually, just, just demographically, you know, so a friend of mine who worked for the British Election Study figured out that, some, you know, 140% of under 30s would have had to vote Remain for us to stay in the European Union because they're just... Not that many of them compared to older people. Uh, so the, the, the dice are, are pretty much loaded against those people. In terms of Brexit fizzling out, I mean, firstly, A, Brexit won't fizzle out. It's not prohibition. Why won't it fizzle out? For two reasons. One, because stuff will keep happening. So this October, the European Union is going to introduce its ESTA system, right? Which will hit Brits, which means that Brits going into the EU have got to be fingerprinted and whatever. Have a massive knock-on effect on holiday traffic, on trade, and it'll be another Brexit crisis. Secondly, the sad fact about Brexit is, well, it's not a sad fact, it's a fact. The fact is, if you are, ne if you are the neighbor of a continental-sized economy, you're gonna spend an awful lot of your waking hours wondering about what that economy is doing because what it does will shape what you do. I mean, the Canadians worry about the US. The recent example in the UK is the carbon border adjustment mechanism that the EU is introducing. And suddenly we've woken up to the fact, bloody hell, if we don't have our own, there's a massive uh, export duty on our steel exports to the European Union. And that's nothing we've done. That's just the European Union changing its rule book. So B Brexit will continue to fizzle away because we will continue to have to take note of what the EU does. What the next big culture issue is, I don't know. I'm just hoping to God it's not Gaza, which it might be. Thank you, Anand. We also have an online audience, Linda and Matt. Do we have questions from the online audience? No? 
Okay. Uh, then. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Not at Hattie necessarily. Um, so I would suggest the lady at the back with her curly hair and the greenish jumper. Uh, the gentleman at the very front with the gloves. Uh, and the gentleman in the middle with the black hoodie. This is a good tip to wear distinctive clothing. <laughs> <laughs> wear a pink top. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask why you think that Labour is so reluctant to properly tax the rich. Um, it seems to me that that would be quite a popular uh, topic, you know, that you could really get people on board. And the question about young people, where you say, obviously you say there are too few of them to make much of an impact. Mm -hmm. But where we know in the, the Brexit referendum that a lot of them, you know, it was the day after, I mean, I don't know if that's a cliche, but the day after they looked to see what is the EU and weren't actually interested. Do you think that that has, a, has had an impact on them? We know that a lot more people were studying politics at school after Brexit. Hello. Uh, I have two questions, uh, one of uh, about the energy part, I think is worth following, is that you, uh, I recently sh sh uh, saw something about the, the Prime Minister Sonak uh, said something very recently that Oh, maybe nuclear uh, energy is the medicine for, uh, for is the antidote for for, for this country uh, without with all the the polemics involving the energy transition uh, phasing out. So I wanted to know what you think this position uh, shows about the 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 views of the how the the ruling class sees the country and uh, other things that you mentioned in the in the beginning of how the the Brexit was not about class and uh, how the for a long time like there was no prime minister being noble for many decades so I wanted to know if you think this this kind of uh, perennial issues in the, in the United Kingdom as class still exists and show some some influence in the society. Um, hi there, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I find it really interesting. Um, I've got a question on the Tory party. Mm -hmm. So you spent a lot of your talk talking about how the biggest threat is from reform. They're really worried about that. And it's going to be a lot about kind of cultural wars, possibly wokeism. Um, however, this weekend we just saw Lee Anderson get kicked out of the Tory party for, frankly, Islamophobic uh, comments which you would think would be pandering to the right. However, Rishi Sunak decided to kick him out, which seems counter to everything that you were saying about the Tory party moving further to the right. So I was hoping you could just sort of expand on, on what you think about that um, and, yeah, the, the thought process behind Rishi Sunak. Thank you. All right, I'm going to do these in reverse order. I don't know why I always do questions in reverse order. I'm going to do it in reverse order. Uh, uh, I mean, there's moving to the right and there's being racist openly racist about an individual. So, you know, remember, Rishi Sunak has got a coalition to manage, and part of that, half of his MPs are screaming at him to get rid of Anderson once and for all, because what he said was totally unacceptable. Rishi Sunak responded in a Rishi Sunak way, which was to basically irritate every constituency, right? So he's irritated the right by getting rid of Lee Anderson. He's irritated the left by saying, the problem was he didn't apologize, he wasn't being racist. So he's irritated the left. He's, managed, he's basically irritated every section of his party. And that is not atypical of this prime minister. He's just not very good at managing the politics. But I don't think there's a contradiction between me saying they're going to tr touch on some of these issues like immigration, small boats, and things like that. Uh, but also the fact that there has to be a line. I mean, they have to I mean, at the end of the day, they have to distinguish themselves from reform as well. Uh, and so they have a discreet offering. And they've got a very wide electorate that includes liberal Tories who find marriage or farage offensive. Uh, one of the curious things about Britain at the moment, of course, is that we do have complete control over our immigration policy, but we have a government that is criticising numbers that are a direct result of the policies it has put into place, which is absolutely surreal. Uh, but that's just where we are now. Uh, Class is still an issue, class still pervades our politics, but the link between class and party has weakened. So for instance, what the polling shows is that the working class are not flocking back to Labour in red wall seats. So class will work differently 
in the future, but my God, class is still prevalent. I mean, just go to a lunch in London and you can, I mean, you can feel it in, especially if you're British, you can just, you know, my, you could tap into all my insecurities by having a conversation with me about class. And that I think is archetypically British in, in many ways. Nuclear, absolutely nuclear. We're not like Germany. We are all in favor of nuclear. The problem again is goes back to what I was saying earlier about short time horizons. And there's a wonderful quote, there's a clip, you can find it. In 2010, Nick Clegg was caught on camera saying, uh, there's no point investing in nuclear because it will only come on stream in 2019. <laughs> and of course, that clip went viral in 2019. As our, you know, uh, it's, it's very, very hard to get our politicians to do things that are long-term in nature. Certainly things where you won't feel the results during one parliamentary term. Uh, nuclear tax. Uh, Labour also wants to be the party of business. And that is taking precedence over anything else in our country at the moment. On the taxing the rich thing, I would say a fundamental issue that I just, again, don't think our politics is capable of getting to grips with is not income inequality, but wealth inequality. Uh, and wealth inequality, particularly through property prices and house values, is absolutely pernicious in the United Kingdom at the moment. I mean, you see it, you know, in my line of work, you see it very, very clearly because, you know, if we, if we at King's want to appoint a sort of mid-career academic at the University of Sheffield, you will leave them with a choice of leaving their six-bedroom house with a massive garden for a two-bedroom flat in the centre of London with their three kids. Uh, and there's no way around that. I mean, the price... Is... So actually, you know, if I were King for a day, I would order a binding review of council tax bans uh, because our properties are taxed insofar as they are taxed on the basis of 1991 values, which is obviously stupid. And you would give the resultant uh, income to local councils to pay for services that are massively underfunded. But I, actually, just saying that out loud, it is utterly obvious that that can never happen, even though it is so clearly, unambiguously, the right thing to do. I mean, you know, I would go to the wall for that argument. I don't see there is any counter argument. So I think we need to start thinking about taxing wealth and, and taxing wealth more effectively. One of the great parallels, I don't know whether this is true in Germany, we have strategies for growth, we have strategies for dealing with the green transition. We have never, to my knowledge, had a strategy for tax. And our tax system is an absolute shit show. Uh, it is so complicated, so contradictory. Marginal tax rates, if you take the income, if you take welfare into account, for earners between 50 and 70 thousand pounds, touch 100%. Uh, it is just a dysfunctional system. But actually, I don't know why I'm wasting my breath because nothing's going to happen. So anyway, leave that. Uh, kids. And it's very interesting, right? you know, what happens to future generations? I suspect that Brexit becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't think, you know, there are a lot of kids around now bemoaning the fact that they can't travel to Europe and they can't do Erasmus. I wonder whether kids in 10 years' time will even be thinking about that because the world they've grown up in will be a world where that wasn't on the table. It'll be a world where actually, why not go to Australia? Why not go to the United States? Because actually, it's the same visa process. It might even be cheaper. Uh, and actually, you know, that sort of thing. I, I mean, just a stupid personal anecdote. The first time I went into railing, uh, I had a, it was early 1980s, I had an Indian passport, okay? And it transpired that travel, going into railing would cost me four times more in visas than it would cost me for uh, the ticket itself. So I got a British passport. Uh, and I, I think people's behavior will change. I think people will look elsewhere. And I think actually you can't simply assume young people are fervently pro-European and so young people in 10 years time will be fervently pro-European. Actually young people in 10 years time might just be far, far less familiar with Europe than young people are now. We are out of time, but we started a little late. So I would propose perhaps two more questions, if that's okay, Arnold. So the lady at the front next to uh, Julia and the lady with the sort of uh, dark reddish orange jumper. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, hello. Hiya. Hello. Um, so I just wanted to ask quickly about the two 
Romani, very Romani parties that supposedly still are there, the Lib Dems and the SNP. Yeah. But the Lib Dems don't actually even seem to want to talk about Brexit either after their um, 2019 election result. And the SNP are in this kind of post-Sturgeon cycle. I'm wondering what role you think those parties that you know, are still on paper very much pro-rejoin, actually, mm -hmm. um, what, what role they could play in a future parliament, whether they'll wield influence in that debate. Well, let me start with the SNP. And can I... Sorry, yeah. we all, is that, can I answer this one first? Right. I've got a very bad memory, and there's more likelihood I'll remember your question if I do it this way. Uh, the SNP are going to lose seats by the look of it. I mean, what's happening in Scotland is really interesting. The support for independence has remained constant. Okay, it's 50-50. But the number of people who think independence is the major issue at the next election has dropped, which means that there are former SNP voters who think the priority is to get the Tories out. So that's what's changed. They'll have less influence as a result, though I cannot stress enough just how crucial the next government is in terms of the debate over Scotland. Because if a Starmer government fails to deliver for Scotland, the SNP go into the next election saying this isn't a Tory issue, this is an England issue. In the same way they've done over the Gaza vote. This is English parties not caring about Scotland. So Starmer has to deliver and be seen to deliver for Scotland. On the EU front, it's interesting because the, the SNP got a lot of pushback for the paper they published on the border, which was absolute magical thinking. One of, there's a book to be written on Brexit paradoxes. And one of the great Brexit paradoxes is the SNP, who opposed Brexit and argued against Brexit and said this is gonna be awful for trade and whatever, are now using the arguments the DUP used during the Brexit process to say, the EU will never impose a border between us and England. Don't be so ridiculous. We could use technology to, over, you know, all that stuff, all that nonsense is now being spouted by the SNP about the border. Because actually, there have been studies that have shown that if Scotland becomes independent and joins the European Union, it will have a massive impact on the Scottish economy because of the border between England and Scotland. So uh, my sense is they're soft peddling a little bit on this at the moment and talking about other things. Uh, but ultimately, the party policy is to rejoin the European Union. Scotland as an independent state inside the European Union will remain part of their uh, prospectus. The Lib Dems, it's really interesting because here's a little challenge for you. If you go to the website of the Lib Dems, there is a policy paper outlining their official party policy, which is joining the single market as a first step towards rejoining the European Union. And I challenge you to find it, okay, because it's hidden. Somewhere. Well, last time I looked, it was quite in. And that's because they've decided not to talk about it. I imagine because focus groups have said, you know, we will, we will shoot any politician who talks about Brexit during this election campaign, right? Because people don't want to hear about it again. It's partly because the Lib Dems are campaigning to win a number of leave voting seats in the Southwest. You can't go to Devon and Cornwall and be remain central, I don't think, and hope to win. And actually, the Lib Dems will have a series of national, of, of local campaigns, some of which, dare I say it, and apologies to Lib Dems, might be contradictory because that's how it looks like they're planning to run this campaign. A really big and interesting question is after the election, if the Lib Dems get 20 to 30 MPs, Brexit is a really easy stick to beat the Labour Party, the Labour government with at that point and try and attract uh, wavering voters from Tories and Labour then if the economy doesn't seem to be doing very well. So it might be that the Lib Dems come back to it but they won't before the election, I don't think. Uh, and whether they do after will be... I mean, the scale of pro-EU activism post-election is a really interesting question because businesses will feel unmuzzled and will talk out more than they did under the Conservatives. The Parliamentary Labour Party might become fractious about the EU because you've got individuals like Stella Creasy, who is the head of Labour for Europe, uh, who might speak out more, and the Lib Dems might speak out more. So it might be that the nature of the Brexit debate changes, but it will only be after an election, I think, rather than before it. Sorry. Thank you, Anand. <laughs> uh, final question of the evening, perhaps a short question and a short answer. Thank you very much. Sorry. No, 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 oh, no, 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 that wasn't. Um, so I guess in general, the picture that you've painted of politics currently in the UK is a bit as though everyone's very deep within the pathless woods. Um, and I'm just curious as to maybe what your outlook is for the evolution 
specifically with respect to how parties define themselves. Mm -hmm. um, do you see more of a reversion towards, or increasing reversion towards things being value-based? And if so, how does that look for policy development? Or um, going back to a more policy-based identity, and maybe is it differential depending on which party's in, in power? The really honest but rubbish answer is I don't know, and it depends. Uh, it depends on what happens. I mean, one of the striking things about politics at the moment is it really is genuinely impossible to say who the Conservative Party is for because they've got this sort of unwieldy base uh, and it will take contradictory policies to, to appeal to different bits of it. I mean, I must admit, one of the, one of the victims of the last 10 years has been what used to be my utter, enduring, blind faith in first-past-the-post as an electoral system. Uh, and, you know, I hate to change my mind, so insofar as I'm doing it, I'm doing it very, very slowly and reluctantly. Uh, but actually, you know, we have an electoral system that has failed to give us, in the famous phrase, strong and stable governments. And if it can't even do that, and if it promotes the kind of adversarialism that means we're inherently short-term, we've got to think about it again, because parties identify themselves in contradistinction to each other, fundamentally. Uh, and whilst that works as an electoral tool, uh, you know, we, there was a thing in the newspapers the other day that Labour are going to clamp down on even more forms of hunting, right? Which, to put it mildly, isn't a national priority, but is a very good way of giving red meat, well, probably that's the wrong, wrong analogy for anti-hunt saboteurs, giving vegetarian meals to their base, and annoying the Tories. That's the only purpose of doing it, okay? There's no national interest. And there's too much of that in our politics at the moment. So actually, it is a big question how our parties define themselves. The problem is, you know, if, if you spend enough time with people in political parties, they are tribal. So there is absolutely zero prospect of a Labour government coming in and legislating for proportional representation because it would be the death of the Labour Party as well as the death of the Conservative Party. Ooh, that's the way to finish. <laughs> Anand, thank you so much. I think we've covered a lot of ground, right, from uh, political party strategies and definitions, British society, and ended with a, with a point on uh, political institutions even. Thank you very much to everyone in the room and online for being uh, with us. A special thanks to the JDC for organizing the event and to Civica for supporting us. And an extra special thanks to Anand. I hope you enjoyed discussing Brexit with a Berlin audience. I know, but you know, 10 years on, <laughs> you're, still, you're still doing Brexit. And I presume over dinner you may be asked, Brexit is for life, won't fizzle out. Uh, I guess we will talk more Brexit later. Thank you so much, Anand. <laughs>